<laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be here again, um, and I want to um, see if we can continue. Uh, you know, really just the practice of um, shamatha, which may be um, may be exceptionally boring, <laughs> but you know, this is what the practice is: is sitting with our mind and um, being with our experience. Um, but before I, I get into that, um, there are two songs I'd like to share. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to see if there are any questions that, that uh, anyone here might have. It could be about Mahamudra, it could be about you know, whatever. Um, and if there aren't, that's fine. Um, so, okay. Good. Well, then I'm going to share the first song. Um, and some of you may have already heard this, um, but it's a song, uh, you know, Doha or Charya Giti from the Mahasada Saraha. And so Saraha was, um, uh, is considered one of the kind of human, early human progenitors of, of the practice of Mahamudra. Um, and so, you know, these, his, his writings are, are some of my favorite um, when it comes to this. And this is just six, um, six lines, I guess they are lines. Um, so again, just allow yourself to settle into an experience of open awareness. And as I recite this, just allow whatever experience that might arise within your consciousness to arise. wait for yeah, I can't wait for that. Okay. Wonderful. So this is the Charya Giti of Saraha. Our own concepts and projects create samsara and nirvana. By our own minds we are imprisoned by this world. I am a stupid yogin with a thought free mind. What is birth and death to me? Birth is just like death, an empty dream and the living and the dead are the same. Whoever here is afraid of birth and dying, they try to produce gold out of mercury. The pilgrim who roams the earth with their own mind, how can they avoid old age and dying? Which comes first, spontaneity or Buddha karma? Saraha says, my religion is a thought-free mind. And this line is my favorite. I am a stupid yogin with a thought-free mind. What is birth and death to me? May we all be stupid. May we all be, uh, like you find, you know, in Dzogchen instructions, but also Mahamudra instructions, these uh, very short lines of advice to practice like a fool or practice like an idiot practice like a simpleton. And of course, you know, we can hear this language and we think, oh, you know, it's insulting. But the point isn't to insult ourselves or others. The point is to actually um, stop doing, stop being complicated, stop being complex. Um, even in a certain way, stop being cre creative, right? And it's not actually that we're like, you know, <laughs> killing these parts off. Uh, but it's more about allowing the cessation of reactivity and subsequent invested change that we get involved in within the experience of thought, or within the experience of mind, so that we can allow everything to dissolve into spaciousness as it happens. And so this is very plain and simple practice. Uh, in a certain way, it's not that dissimilar to Chan and aspects of Zen, right? It's this kind of simple, ordinary practice. Um, in fact, a little bit before I got online, one of my teachers messaged me and said, liberate your logical thoughts. Right? That's all the message was, exclamation point. 
So just be on our toes, so to speak. Allow everything to liberate, self-liberate. So this first line from the song, our own concepts and projects or concepts and projections create samsara and nirvana. Oh, the world should be like this. Oh, my life should be like this. Uh, I was teaching on Sunday, referencing you know the great Bama of Instagram, uh, where I had noticed somebody had posted something on Instagram saying, you know, oh, I like I basically like I wish I had more time to practice. I wish I had you know didn't have to work. I wish I didn't live in a capitalist you know society. This person doesn't live in the US, but they live in a capitalist country. And I totally heard them, you know, I was like, oh man, you know, I've, I feel this way too, you know, I don't want to be crushed by the machine that's slowly crushing all of us. Um, and at the same time, you know, from this perspective of open space, well, there is no other place to practice than wherever it is that we, where we you know, that we are. Um, and we talk about spiritual bypassing, and sometimes, you know, it's such a fancy word. So we make the expression of the way it arises very fancy. But often the most kind of insidious form of spiritual bypassing is thinking that it's somewhere other than right here or wherever you are. You know, our practices, our mind, our practices, our emotional body, our practices, our relationship to location practices what is happening right now and letting this be the focal point and and really kind of you know beginning to understand that these lines are actually gifts so our own concept and projections or projects create samsara and nirvana by our own minds we are imprisoned in this world by our own minds we're either prisoners or we are you know people who are free That's all. That's really, that's really all it is. Birth is just like death, an empty dream. All of the labels, all of the preferences, and the living and dead are just the same, no difference. You know, the only difference between our mind and the mind of a Buddha is recognizing our mind to be the mind of a Buddha. But this is what is called practicing the view. This is actually quite important in, in Mahamudra, is understanding that our mind, <clears throat> when left alone, is perfection is blissfulness, is natural freedom. But when, when our mind needs to be something else and we need to tinker or you know, adjust or apply external, uh, you know, so like in Tibetan medicine, they talk about external therapies like massage and things like this. When our, medit when our meditation becomes an external therapy that we are applying to mind, we're actually kind of missing the point. So when it comes to the practice of Mahamudra in particular, we want to let go. We want to undo our belt, you know, and maybe unbutton the button of our pants because our belly is hanging out, our, our Vajra belly. You know, we're just trying to be at ease, relaxed, expansive, free, and in a certain way, non-engaged. Right? But what, what is this non-engagement about? The non-engagement is about not doing, not adjusting. Um, and it's fascinating, this, this idea of becoming uh, deeply embodied and authentic in our practice while also relinquishing the need to control and the need to adjust. Right? How does this greater relationship of being embodied in our practice and being authentic in our practice relate to a sense of increased settling, increased ease, 
increased relaxation. So I wanted to share that. Um, but actually, maybe we could sit for a bit in, in shamatha. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, you know, again, I've been teaching from Boko Rinpoche's um, opening the door to certainty. Um, and actually, <laughs> this morning, in my meeting with one of my other gurus, uh, Facebook, um, I saw actually the words of one of my gurus, Boko Rinpoche, uh, kind of, you know, posted up, which made me very happy. Um, <clears throat> and so this, I'm paraphrasing right now, but this was a, a passage, I guess, from, might have been from one of his books, but it was basically saying that the only thing, oh no, the, 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 pretty much the exact words were, many people are mistaken in their practice because they think they need to get rid of thought activity. And he said, you know, this is actually impossible. And this is important to recognize too is that the mind is a mind, right? It, it does, it thinks, it does, it cognizes, um, it's, it's reactive, right? You poke it, you prod it, you put something green in front of it, it begins to, you know, analyze the greenness, put something blue, begins to look at the blueness, it, it likes to compare, you know, con you know contrast, um, but it's like a cow. A cow does what a cow does. The mind does what a mind does. And if a cow began to act like a tiger, we would freak out. If the mind did something other than what it naturally does, that would be quite unusual. And so what his point is, is that it's impossible to, you know, don't expect the mind to be something other than it is. And once we are able to actually accept what it is and be present with it, and let it arise and let it unfold the way it does, we actually begin to see what it is and it's no longer scary. It's no longer something that torments us. It, uh, that which previously had been, maybe led us to feel unstable, actually eases and we begin to recognize mindful what it is and we find stability. We find patience, we find joy, we find uh, an experience that's like meeting the face of an old friend. And so this is an important thing to, to remember. I don't expect your meditation practice to be uh, <laughs> fireworks, right? When all we're doing is we're sitting with the same mind that was reactive from the moment we woke up, much like you know a body of water that we keep throwing pebbles into how strange to assume that we could throw pebbles into ponds or lakes and there be no ripples and of course one thing that does begin to happen uh, and this is by the very kind of virtue of the qualities of what shamatha does is it allows us to rest into an experience of mind in which thought activity actually kind of slows down a little bit. There's more space, there's more space, there's more peace, there's more, there's less reactivity. And we can open up to the experience of awareness, which when we begin shamatha becomes quite challenging because we are so wrapped up with all of the thoughts, all of the worries, all of the anxieties, all of the time. Yeah. And if this is not the right time to ask a question, oh, we can, I can wait until later. Um, Rod, I think I know, like, I have the answer to the question I'm about to ask, but um, just wondering if to hear it, like, not from inside my own head, um, and curious about other people's experiences as well. Um, but at the, in the same time of like not shaming or rebuking, like the fact that thought arises because it's not helpful. Um, but also thinking about the view. So like from the perspective of the view, 
like when thought arises, like how to regard it as the face of an old friend without personalizing and elaborating on it, even that little inch, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Cause it can, I mean, for me, it just feels so intensely personal that it can be quite painful actually to not, to try and not personalize it. Um, and so just any, any wisdom or insight that can be shared in like concrete methods for resting in the view as thought arises and understanding it as, you know, the play of like a fathomless dance of interbeing um, that like, I can't possibly find the beginning or the middle or the end of, or, you know, something in that terrain. I'm not sure if anyone else um, has a similar experience, but that would be helpful for me to hear your reflections on. Yeah. Yeah, well, before I say anything, I'd like to see if anybody does have any um, uh, either shared experience and or uh, techniques that you've come to uh, rely on or find meaning in, <clears throat> in um, finding, finding a friend. Yeah, pain. The first thing that came to my mind as I understood the question was Guru Yoga. You know, um, I don't know how I could say something else beyond that. Yeah, yeah does anybody else have any? Yeah, I uh, I used to like try and you know chase the thoughts away, but now I just let them come and go, um, and and not be judgmental, you know. So, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, but I I still you know it's it's difficult because sometimes I you know it, it, the thought turns into like a movie or something, you know. And and then I and then I am judgmental because I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so that that's kind of where I'm at. It just depends on, um, you know, how kind of um, how I am that day, you know, wh whether I've got some kind of control over it. Well, it's not really even control, but whether I can just let it come and go, rather than chasing it and you know following it, attaching to it. That's my thought. Thank you. Yeah, other thoughts? Feelings, experiences? Yeah. Yeah, I think my experience is that the um that the that the, the the more I'm practicing and the years of practice it it's just turning more into like stuff you know and the the personal part of it is that the, that there's like a an like uncanny kind of familiarity with like the like the voice that I think in or something you know and so there have been times in my practice where it gets weird and where I have more questions that maybe like come up in you know other texts or places is where when I start playing with it and kind of manipulating it and I'm like well what is this if I can like make it turn into a banana or if I can make it like recite my my mother's name or like what it's not stuff like the clouds because I can't make them turn into my mother's face or a banana yet but like with thoughts, I can do stuff to them. And so then mostly I'm just like, but that's not what I'm practicing. So I'll like not do that, but that I can is like weird and I don't like understand, you know? So I don't know, that's why it's not the same stuff as other stuff, but like in my practice, I, you know, mostly don't mess with it, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, Travis. 
Any other reflections? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay if there aren't any any additional ones. Um, <clears throat> and please feel free to chime in. You know, as as um, as you like. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to address this. Um, I think the one, the one helpful thing to keep in mind is um, how we, and, and it can be helpful to also just reflect on this, our relationship to habit. And so it can be very useful actually to use spontaneous ways of breaking experience, right? Because even our habitual reaction to the recognition of thought activity can become problematic. And um, Katie, you kind of touched on this a little bit, right? Like the, the um, and I may not capture the exact words you used, but um, you know, that, that, that judgmental quality that comes in when we you know, recognize, oh my God, like, <laughs> like I was present until some moment and then I can't actually even remember where I kind of went off course, but now I'm thinking about Paris or something and I've never even been there or, you know, like, what are we going to do next Saturday morning? You know, I just, how did that just creep up? Um, or like what's on TV tonight, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, the, there is a lot to be said about trying to be spontaneously different upon recognition of thought activity so that we're not coming back to any kind of reification. I think on some level there is an aspect of ourselves that's very comforted, comforted by habit, right? And habit means we exist, habit means we're here, habit means we're safe. Um, and so to destabilize ourselves a little bit um, in our response helps us to kind of, gives us a little bit of extra, maybe, you know, kinetic energy to push through, to come right back, you know, maybe awareness to push through, to come right back to direct experience freshly. And then, then though the problem with that sometimes can be just staying in that place of mild, non-engagement just being uh, uh, you know uh, alert in a very dualistic way subject object myself looking at thought activity waiting for something to come and then pouncing on that right so um if we can have a soft easeful release upon recognition it's kind of like playing hot potato but most of the time, just being totally honest, like we're not necessarily even aware of the fact that somebody threw the potato into our hands. It just happens to be there we, when we're like, oh, <laughs> wow, this got here, you know? And so how very lightly to just let go, you know, and come right back to the experience. And I think that also like with this gentle, um, yeah, I like to use the term self-loving because um, this is not the kind of thing we want to beat ourselves into submission around. You know, maybe there are other kinds of uh, discipline in Dharma settings, perhaps, perhaps never, but, but perhaps where a little, little bit more hard discipline can be helpful, right? But, um, but being very soft and non-reactive in our coming back to awareness is the most helpful because we end up um, also on some level sometimes wanting to prove that this won't work to ourselves, you know, be like, ah, see, like, you know, such a schmuck, <laughs> such a fool, man. You keep like, this is pointless and you know it, you know, maybe we should get up and go to the park or something like that. Um, so it's what becomes, you know, 
an important kind of crux of the practice is open, relaxed, easy, forgiving uh, acknowledgement that we're going to miss the point, miss the boat, misapprehend, and that it's not even, the point isn't to get it right, right? Because there's a huge correlation between hope and fear, good and bad, right and wrong, you know, and practicing within those brackets. What we're trying to do is maybe let the, those brackets down as we practice, which is also quite uncomfortable because we've become um, used to knowing where we are in relationship to that. And then also used to knowing where everything else is in relationship to that. This is why it can be actually quite scary and unpleasant uh, to begin a meditation practice because um, even even thoughts that are messed up, right? Like I, I was reading a really nice um, description, meditation instruction recently that was um, basically like, you know, the practice of meditation is, is basically just being with the weather. And sometimes the weather is terrible, and sometimes the weather is exactly what you want it to be. Right? The fundamental thing, though, is that there's no difference between both of those. They're both weather. Right? And so if we can be with the rain and the hail and the wind, and we can be with the sunlight, the light breeze, you know, or the, the heat, if that's what we, you know, find we like. If we can be able to just be with both, with the full acknowledgement is that this is just what's going on, you know, then we're able to have a bit more resilience, a little bit more ease. But the moment we find ourselves kind of veering off, really just gently bringing ourselves back. So in a way, it's a little bit like herding cats to an extent, <laughs> but then also being comfortable with the fact that I mean, these are cats, right? They're not dogs. So why should I expect a dog-like response? That would be quite strange, right? Uh, and because they're cats, sometimes they'll come, sometimes they'll go. Sometimes my, you know, attention will, will be, you know, very uh, focused and singular. Other times it will be diffuse, right? Sometimes thought activity will be really you know, intense and in your face, sometimes it will be settled. You know, and there's this additional kind of secondary benefit, uh, and I've talked about this before, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but um, there's no better way to learn patience than to sit with mind. And we'll often think about, you know, training in patience as being something, we, you know, an external quality we need to develop or add I need more patience, gotta go fill, <laughs> fill myself up with patience. Just sit with your mind, you know? And if you want true patience, then sit with your mind in a way that's non-judgmental, right? that doesn't have expectation. And this expectation piece is so key, letting, letting expectation go. What is it supposed to be? Zen tradition, the ordinary mind. It's quite nice. In the Tibetan tradition, we have tamaki shepa, like ordinary cognition, right? This ordinary experience. Right? So it's not like, ooh, you know, sun rays coming down and birds chirping and Bambi and you know, like Cinderella and Prince Charming and you know, the seven dwarves all come and sit at your feet. <laughs> Oh, maybe we should have like a Disney retreat. <laughs> but anyway, so it's not like that all the time, right? It's just, you know, sitting with our boredom. We're sitting with this leg that keeps falling asleep. We're sitting, I, you know, I'm in Brooklyn, so it's sitting with all the atmospheric noise. What can I do? You know, so this, this soft ease, and boy, you know, in times like this, Soft ease, if everybody had some soft ease going around, um, 
you know, I think the, the obviously the world would be a better place. This country would be a better place. Um, and, and I think that this is also worth looking at too, the kind of unintended transformational qualities that sitting with our own mind uh, provides us with, sitting with our reactivity, sitting with our sadness, sitting with our fear, so sitting with our, our relationship to hope and fear and just being a little bit, I was just talking with somebody earlier today and I kept using the term cosmopolitan. Like if our, um, oh, Bob, good to see you. Um, our practice can lead us to a more cosmopolitan place. You know, cosmopolitan in the sense of being open and accepting. Cosmopolitan in the sense of like walking through Times Square and you see every different kind of person, right? And it's no big deal. You know, it's just the vividness. So for us to be able to experience vividness. So, in any event, um, let's settle down into shamatha um, for a bit. We'll just do something like fourteen minutes or so. Um, allowing yourself to um, sit in whatever way is comfortable. Um, if you're s seated, and you know, just try and have your back as straight as is comfortable. Um, try and keep your shoulders open a bit. Your hands can be on your knees or in meditation mudra. You can have your gaze directly in front of you, like, or it could be slightly downward. Or if you're kind of a little low energy today, you can kind of raise your gaze. Allow yourself to settle into the experience of relaxed breathing. And let that be something that your body centers in on. So let your breathing be natural. It doesn't have to be slow. It doesn't need to be anything other than it is. You can either bring your awareness to your breath, gently noticing every inhalation and exhalation. Or you can bring your awareness to an object in your field of vision. Very gently, just kind of like hanging a sweater on a hook, placing your visual consciousness on an object. Alternatively, you can visualize an object, a Buddha on the crown of your head, for example. Or a a little dot at the level of the brow between the eyebrows or down by your neck. And lastly, if this feels comfortable, you can use mind itself as a way of focusing, allowing awareness of mind. allow yourself to rest naturally into this experience, lightly holding to let the six nails, letting go of the past, letting go of expectation as to what comes next. Letting go of the present moment, needing to be anything in particular. Letting go of thinking and the need to make something happen. Letting go of controlling the need to do anything. And just allow yourself to rest. And we'll sit like this for 14 minutes.
Take your time. Okay. So, how's everyone doing? So there's this other song that I, um, so I must have shared, I don't know, uh, at some point, maybe the summer of 2020, um, so it's going on two years, so it's good to come back. Um, this one is by Nakpopa, uh, it's called Nakpopa's uh, Doha Kosha, <clears throat> and it's divided into um, two, three, two parts. So the first begins, well, it begins first with this way to the natural state, welcome. And then the first part is, technically there's a, there's actually a, a because it's labeled as on the cessation of extreme views, meditation, action, and result. So it begins, proud worldly people with your texts and logic claim, I know emptiness, but they're wrong. Understanding is impossible, and there's no way in. Emptiness is empty of emptiness too. No birth can exist because of birthlessness. No suffering and dying, becoming or rebirth. The intellect conceives concepts, not realization. The problem can never be resolved intellectually. Concept, I'm sorry, conceptual thought is delusive thought. Neither the thinker nor the thought is truly existent. Contingent truth, ephemeral truth, pave the path of delusion. When the intellect finds its way home, home to the mighty experience of samadhi, it finds knowledge of the sujatas and the wrathful deities and their retinues. It would be a mistake to make any effort here. Giving and taking are both so tiresome. The dharmakaya is like the sky, reaching it, Reaching for it is like a beggar stretching for alms. Hoping for it is like a deer's expectation in chasing a mirage. Already and ever a Buddha, what a blunder to seek for it. Fantasy beings enter the middle way where dream forests crown sky mountains. Dream elephants march on a <laughs> to a mirage oasis, and the sons of barren women rule the Gandharva cloud kingdom. I, Nakpopa, don't want change. I don't walk a path. I stay natural. Realizing suchness, I don't appraise it. Knowing definitive truth without critique, grip on the emptiness, appearance, dualism slips away, and phenomenon no longer impinging the intellect surrenders. So there's a lot in this. Um, <clears throat> but some of the kind of choice pieces, I mean, starting off, proud worldly people with your texts and logic claim, I know emptiness, but they're wrong. Right, and, and this is so, uh, liberatingly true you know we can pick up a book on madhyamaka and there's no harm in doing that right but there's a big difference between sitting down and reading about these things and just sitting with mind and sitting with thought activity as arises and opening up to the experience of letting that settle to spaciousness and dissolving 
Where does it come from? Where does it go? Where does it come from? Where does it go? So this is kind of, this is probably the most powerful way of quote unquote studying emptiness. It's also the it's not gonna get you a college degree or a graduate degree, it's not gonna make you, you know, famous. But you'll understand it. You'll understand it pretty quickly. And you'll understand it pretty easily. But all of these proud, worldly people with their texts and logic claiming, I know emptiness, but they're wrong. Understanding is impossible. And there's no way in. Emptiness is empty of emptiness too. There's no real way in other than experiencing this. No birth can exist because of birthlessness. So where the mind which is birthless, now how to understand that other than just being in direct relationship, direct experience of this. The intellect conceives concepts, not realization. <laughs> this is very good, very frustrating for some people. The problem can never be resolved intellectually. Our, our meditation practice is really, I mean, I don't know if anybody here has had this experience and it'd be great if you could just let me know if you have. This process is so um, intuitive and relatively feminine, so to speak, in the sense of just, you know, being open to this experience. And there's no positing, there's no logic. So when my teacher messages me, you know, liberate the mind of logic, or liberating thoughts of logic. Just let it happen. Conceptual thought is delusive thought. Neither the thinker nor the thought is truly existent. Contingent truth, ephemeral truth, these pave the path of delusion. It would be a mistake to make any effort here. Giving and taking are so tiresome. No effort. When we sit, right, we don't need to effort thoughts. <laughs> that just comes, right? It comes, it comes, it comes, it comes, it comes, it comes. But, you know, we also don't need to effort awareness so much either. It's there. It's there. It's there. We just need to slow down. We just need to begin to rest into it. Dharmakaya is like the sky. Reaching for it is like a beggar reaching for alms. Hoping for it is like a deer's expectation and chasing a mirage. Already ever a Buddha, what a blunder to seek it. It's another one of these um, forms of spiritual bypassing around having ideas about the result, having ideas of what our awakening will look like. You know, my root teacher used to take me to the um, this crowded bazaar called Lal Bazaar. And as we would walk, you know, all these people, it was kind of like a farmer's market. People would come from all over Sikkim and they'd bring their fresh cheese and their fresh butter. And, um, it was like intense situations. People who just caught river fish that were like, you know, sardine size. They might have five of them out and that's what they were selling. You know? Then there are people who walk their cattle from Darjeeling and you know, the, they'd have big hunks of meat, chickens, you know, people from the plains bringing big farmed fish to 
tomatoes, fruits, everything. And everybody would have all of their stuff out. And, you know, my root teacher would always point out, you know, any one of these people could be a Buddha. Any one of these, maybe all of them, are all Siddhas. Realization is not extraordinary. All of these people could be awakened. And it's important to kind of approach it from that headspace and not this kind of, um, you know, thing where like Keanu Reeves plays the Buddha <laughs> or Brad Pitt or some other, like all these, all these fancy, you know, shiny things, awakening me. It's like prosperity gospel kind of stuff, right? Like, you know, if you practice, everything's going to be amazing. Right? We practice and life is what it is, mind is what it is, body is what it is, body wears out and gets sick, body wears out and dies. But it's, there's so much more space that we experience. I, Nakpopa, don't want change. I don't walk a path. I stay natural. Realizing suchness, I don't appraise it. Resting into the nature of mind, resting into the nature of, whether it's Rigpa, whether it's primordial purity, not appraising it, not picking it up, like, I, oh, it's over there, I can't reach it, but my son Winston is going through a Rubik's Cube phase, so we have Rubik's Cubes all over the place, and, you know, so, like, with our practice, it's not like a Rubik's Cube, where we're, like, you know, Oh, Rigpa, like, let me take it apart. Let me try and let me do it like this. Let me do it like that. As if I could do just the blue side. If I could do just the green side. You know. Don't appraise it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let it be easy. Let it be unique. Let it be normal. Knowing the definitive truth without critique, the grip on emptiness, appearance, dualism slips away without critique. Phenomena no longer impinging, the intellect surrenders. I believe also. Um, So, you know, what's clear from these songs is that this is a very intuitive practice. Right? It is about being and not doing. It's about, you know, in a, in, a, in a way, I kind of like this language. I know it can get a little dicey for folks. Um, surrender. Like it's about surrendering. Right? It's about relinquishing. I think we find in other faith traditions these kind of metaphors around um, hard work, right? This is about like at the end of a day of hard work, putting our tools down and sitting in rest, like you know, turning turning Mahamudra practice into the practice of observing a Sabbath, a Sabbath of every moment, a Sabbath of my mind right now, not doing, not even picking up a woman, <laughs> which is really what you're not allowed to do. Sabbath, anything bigger than a wall, <clears throat> in some interpretations. And so let us be impractical. Let us be simpletons. Let us be lazy fools and just be with everything that's arising. All of this heady, 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 headache, headache, constant thinking, constant thinking, ideation. Blah, 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 blah. But my teachers are always pointing out, and they always have, stop thinking, stop being smart, stop thinking, stop being smart. And it's not about be dumb, you're stupid. It's not like that. It's just stop objectifying, stop externalizing, stop projecting. Stop making connections. This is the one problem with Tantra for some people is like it's, you know, really connection, 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 connection. This equals that. You know, 
seeing things in pairs or threes or fours or fives, five Buddha families. <laughs> it's very psychedelic uh, in that way where, you know, not even just the imagery as much as this kaleidoscope of, of just things repeating themselves. Which is actually important to recognize because this does highlight a profound difference at times in the view that you find in Tantra and the view that you find in non-conceptual approaches like Mahamudra and Atta Yoga or all nature and sunshine, right? And so, you know, this is something that Gampopa and a lot of a lot of people have pointed out the, the importance of letting go of transforming the mind, letting go of you know, isolating ourselves from hardship and just resting directly into these things as they happen. What a beautiful thing. All of a sudden, you know, like we were saying at the beginning of this, we're surrounded by wonderful places to practice, whether you're up in a mountain like Payne or in Brooklyn like me, and anywhere in between. Colorado, Maryland, Chicago, Florida, Minneapolis, Nova Scotia, wherever we are, busy, rural, beautiful, nasty, <laughs> doesn't matter. It's all the ground we practice. Whether our minds are beautiful or nasty, So with this, um, if we can sit for another 14 minutes, just try and allow yourself to settle again with ease into the moment. Do whatever it is you need for yourself to be relaxed. And bring your awareness back to your breath. And let yourself use whatever anchor feels appropriate, whether or not it is just the breath or an object in your field of reference or a visualized object or mind itself. And we'll settle this way.
and slowly bring yourself back to the group. <coughs> So, slowing down, being slow, being relaxed, Letting things come and go. Not needing to do, 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 instead of being. Just let things happen. Don't get too intense. And Bokromche once said, uh, uh, don't get weird. You don't need to do a lot. And the really lovely thing about him is he was so simple and humble and not in this kind of, you know, like, oh, he's so simple and humble. <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, he really was this embodiment of simplicity and humility. And, and um, you know, he had this kind of very small, scrappy monastery. And eventually people we're like, you know, Rinpoche, you need a bigger monastery. And he was like, I don't care about that. And, and, you know, and he put it put off for years. And, um, and then one day he consented and I, I went <laughs> to go see him. <laughs> and the construction was, had begun and all this. And he, he told me, he said, you know, oh yeah, some people seem to think that I need all of this stuff. And they keep asking me. And so I just said, fine, you know, you, you, you want it, you build it. <laughs> and he, he died like, um, like six months after that. So he never saw it be finished. <laughs> it was kind of a little bit, a little, um, you know, kind of an appropriate ending, so to speak. And of course, his tuku is there now, but um, yeah, you know, we don't need to be super complex. We don't need to be super famous. We don't need to be super, you know, Super people. We just need to be ourselves. And this is really what this practice kind of points us back to. It's just be ourselves. Mess up as we do. Come back as we do. Settle into space as we do. Mess up as we do. Just let it just be easy. So maybe this can be our homework for this week. Is it this week, let's be easy and simple. And let's not get upset if we mess up. And let's not get upset if we miss the point. And let's just come back with ease and joy and love when we realize we do. So if that feels okay to all of you, maybe we can pause this here and dedicate the merit to all beings who take their minds so seriously. Every thought is the center of the universe. Every thought is the reason to be, to raise attention. May all beings begin to recognize that their own mind is Buddha mind. May all beings open up to the wonderful, beautiful spaciousness that undergirds every moment of our being. May all beings learn to tame their minds. May all beings learn, come to see, come to experience that their minds are beautiful, primordial purity, the ornament of Dharmakaya itself. May all be blessed. May your practice be deep. I'll see you guys next week or before. Who knows? <laughs> bye bye